Hello everyone, how's it going? It's your host Devon is here with Trip Shooting Podcast, here to inoculate you with some new knowledge. And on today's episode, we're continuing our Mushroom Showcase series with episode 2, Psilocybe Cyanescence. Now, I have to preference this video by saying, or podcast rather, by saying, A, I am not a professional mycologist, I'm just a hobbyist, an amateur. I just recently got onto this profession a few months ago, so I may have some information that's left out of this video. I may accidentally say something incorrectly, things of that nature. Please don't crucify me too much about that. Correct me in the comments if I make a mistake. And two, whenever I speak on illegal substances or like illegal drugs, anything of, of that nature, I always preference by saying I'm not condoning the use, consumption, or cultivation of any of these type of drugs or chemicals. This is only for educational purposes. Look at your province's laws to see um, if they apply to you. Anyways, today we're going to start off the psilocybe cyanescence episode by mentioning a little genealogy of the mushroom itself. This mushroom has a typically golden brown to dark brown-esque cap. It's usually typically more golden brown when it's younger, but gets caramel brown more as it ages. It has a wavy cap, thus giving it the name the wavy cap. You know, it's also known as the wavy cap a lot. And the stem is usually just white along the base. I mean, white all along its entire st stipe. Yeah, I believe that's how you say it. Stipe. And, you know, usually the same shape. It bruises blue whenever it's handled. You know, typical psilocybe activity. It has dark purple to almost black spore prints. Sorry if you keep hitting those little bumps. I keep accidentally hitting my mic. <laughs> but, yeah. Dark purple to almost black spore prints. It usually can be found in the season's fall to early winter. It's around the September to December range. And they're usually around huge clusters. Or, you know, they're solitary beings on dung or wood chips. And they're saprotrophic. So, you know, you can typically see them around trees or any other place that needs to have decomposition going on. That type of relationship between plants and the mushroom. And a few more interesting facts about this mushroom is that it is a very potent mushroom. It contains very high amounts of psilocybin and psilocin. And these are usually found across the West Coast, England, and a few other countries around the world. But, you know, people mainly report seeing them in the West Coast in America. Now, let's get more into the nitty gritty of the psilocybe cyanescence. Obviously, this is a cousin or, you know, in the same family as the psilocybe cubensis, which is a very popular mushroom, you know, the golden teacher. We spoke about that mushroom a few times on the podcast. But yeah, it is a, it's within that same species. So it's general effects or, you know, it's around the same general effects. I've only had wavy caps probably once in my life and the effects were pretty similar so I can't really give too much detail on that I'm sorry I keep hitting my mic guys it's really close to my face and another thing that about the psilocybe cyanescence mushroom that I particularly like myself is I really like the distinction of the waviness of the cap because like I've seen many psilocybe cubensis mushrooms in my life and most of the time the caps you know they're not really wavy like that. And the wavy cap, you know, it doesn't really do anything in terms of like the potency or anything like that. It just, it's one of those characteristic differences that kind of makes you think more in terms of the mushroom's genetics and how genetic expression can make a huge difference in determining speciology. I was about to say speciology. I don't know if that's a word or not, but the species of the mushroom, you know, the genetics of the mushroom, even the potency of the mushroom could be affected by the gene expression. So, it's just another one of them examples where that one little change of the detail can help people identify these mushrooms even more. And I think they're also like very cool, very beautiful mushrooms. I love, I just love the color of all psilocybe cubensis caps like that. Golden brown is just something that you really can't see in many other species besides their obvious lookalikes, which, you know, be aware of the lookalikes of psilocybe mushrooms in general. You know, they usually have brown cast but their stems are a little bit also on the brown side which is an easy indicator that you know that those are not psilocybe and also psilocybe mushrooms tend to be 
more hardier mushrooms, whereas their lookalikes can like break off really easily. Like they're way more flimsy than psilocybin mushrooms. So those are just a few indicators of their lookalikes. Um, I don't really have anything else really to add to this episode, just because you know, psilocybin cyanesin, and psilocybin cubins is you know a lot of the psilocybin mushrooms. They're really similar in a lot of ways, but they're also different in a lot of ways. Like I said, you know, with the whole cap incidence and the whole um, how much psilocybin they produce, how much psilocin they produce, all that. There's a whole bunch of different um, aspects you can go into psilocybin cyanesin mushrooms. But the point of this whole series is just to kind of showcase the mushrooms, give you a little general information about them. If you want to go more into detail into these mushrooms, I highly recommend searching up your own information. There's this YouTube channel and like this blog called Double Blind. They have really nice um, series on these different types of mushrooms. Like that's how I learned about Golden Teachers and like how much mushrooms usually cost to sell and things of that nature. Like they're a really good source for people getting into mycology, specifically on the psychedelic aspects of mushrooms. But if you want to get more into just the overall mushrooms themselves, I just recommend buying books. You know, there's a bunch of field guides. There's a bunch of psilocybin mushroom holy bibles, things of that nature that you can get into. Anyways, I'm Devonis. This has been Trip Seating. And I know it's a little bit of a short episode, but, you know, there's not much information to convey. So, I mean, there's a lot of information to convey, but this is just an introductory type episode. So, if you want me to go more into detail about the psilocybin cyanescence mushroom, I will do so. But until then, this has been Devonis and Trip Seating, and I will see you in the next one. Have a good one. Um, hello everyone. I forgot to mention one big thing, and it's like the difference between cultivating it and finding it in the wild. And not differences in terms, because obviously there's differences, you know, but I mean like in terms of difficulty, practicality, things of that nature. And in terms of practicality, unless you live in the areas where they are prevalent, which is not very many places in the grand scheme of, you know, the earth, I highly recommend just cultivating them obviously you know if it's legal where you are to cultivate them but i would highly just recommend cultivating them it's just a lot easier a lot more practical it's usually the same general setup that you would do for any psilocybin mushrooms you know keep the humidity and heat well make sure the temperature doesn't get like above 75 or 80 but not below like 60 55 because you know you don't you don't want it to get like have a higher chance of getting trap or any trick, my bad, trick or any of those other type of contaminants that mushrooms can get. But you don't want it to be too slow to the point where your mushrooms are taking like months and months to even colonize in a grain spawn before you can even transfer it to bulk substrate. And also for these, they're also dung lovers, but they don't necessarily need dung. But if you want them to grow fast or like and more hardy, then I definitely recommend dung based substrates. And obviously keeping your one-to-one ratio of substrate to bulk. I mean substrate to um, grain spawn. I don't really know too much about details and the measurements, like I said in previous episodes. So you'd have to look up the specifics of what is the one-to-one ratio depending on your monotub or if you're using a shoebox. How, how many um, grain spawn jars you have versus how much substrate you have, all that nature. But yeah, that was just a little bit of an extra note that I wanted to add at the end of this video just to make sure that if you are considering getting them, cultivating them in your manner, I can't stop you, but just I'm trying, I wanted to educate you on the proper ways to do so. Also, if you wanted to help a little bit with just ventilation and circulation of water with your substrate, I recommend using vermiculite. Vermiculite is not necessary. It's not even like that much of a help but you know any little help that you can get with cultivation is going to just help you in the long run in terms of the happiness of your mushrooms the hardiness of them and the longevity of your beds so anyways now this has been Devonis from trip sitting and i'll see you guys in the next one